the 18th chapter of Matthew. Usually we think of our instructions for the New Testament church as coming out of Paul's epistles, but Jesus had a lot of things to say too, and tonight's chapter's got a few verses about uh, church discipline in it. 18th chapter, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus and said, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's a funny thing for disciples to be so cool. Because in asking who's the greatest, you know what they're thinking? Sure ain't him, must be me, right? You tell us, Jesus, who's the greatest? <clears throat> and instead of just answering, Jesus gave them an object lesson. Verse 2, Jesus called a little child. You already know who's going to be the greatest, right? Jesus called a little child unto, them, unto him and set him in the midst of them. And then he told the disciples and us, he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, that means you've got to be changed from this to that, and become as little children, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. So to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be something different. Now, what, what is it about children? Well, one thing about little children is uh, unless something's really wrong, they, they completely trust daddy, and they're humble, and they're, you ever notice how quick kids forgive? <laughs> they can get in a big fight, and a little bit, you look down there laying down the floor coloring with one another, right? And Jesus said, you got to be like that. you got to be humble and quick to forgive and trust your father. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You ever notice the, the, the traits of the kingdom of heaven is usually quite the opposite of what the world is. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to be humble. That's In the world, it's the opposite. Of that. And whoever received one such little child in my name receives me. So, as I read that today, I thought to make that very practical. How, how do we receive children in, in Jesus' name? Well, We've got children's church. We've got Miss Susan and children's church, but our missions do that too. Lookout Mountain Conservancy is, is giving children a chance. You know, in the St. Jude's mm -hmm. children's research, uh, disaster responses, that involves children and adults. The chick ministry, where we, we bought chicks for people in third world countries, you know, that's many different ways and we're doing that in the name of Jesus but we're going to find out the following verses that little children is not always just little children but it can also be new believers too Who, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it's better for him key word being better because there's something worse than this It'd be better for him that a millstone hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. It means there's something worse than that. Woe unto the world. Woe is the prophet's pronunciation of judgment. Woe unto the world because of offenses. There's always going to be offenses and there's always going to be people offended, right? And we're living in a time where, boy, it's like everybody's offended over everything. <laughs> people didn't used to get offended. Uh, I saw this on Facebook, and they're right. said, some of this generation today, if they'd watched Archie Bunker, would have died. <laughs> you know? Woe unto the world because of offenses. So we're going to offend people. We, you know, sometimes you just can't help it. If you preach the gospel, you're going to offend people. But, but there's no re reason to go around just offending people just to be offending people. <clears throat> it must needs that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee, because it's better. It means there's something worse than this. I saw a poor guy the other day. I was over at Cracker Barrel, and he looked to be about the right age for probably an a, a Iraq Iraqi veteran. And uh, he was sitting over there in a wheelchair, and the girl with him was feeding him. He had one leg took off here, the other leg took off right you know, as short as you could arm took off here and a bit of an arm right here and I heard him talking over there you know he was fine otherwise fine otherwise but uh, just as 
that, that's bad. It'd be bad to be like that, wouldn't it? But there's something worse than that, Jesus said. The emphasis is there's something worse than that. There's something worse than if you had to cut your foot and hands and eyes off because there's something that's eternal. Because it's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. Take heed or be careful that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father which is heaven. It's probably about the strongest uh, verse that there is in the New Testament. You heard about guardian angels? Well, here's something that could imply that there are guardian angels. There are, those kids' angels always behold the Father's face. But in verse 11, Jesus takes this, and I think you can take the little children as also just being new believers too. Because the Son of Man, the Messiah, the, the term for the, the, the Christ, He's come to save that which was lost. That's those that have been converted and have become like little children. And he come to save those which is lost. Do you know that's good news? Because we were all lost. <laughs> we're the ones that he come to save. How think you, verse 12, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine, goes to the mountains and seeks that one which is gone astray? Seek those that have gone astray. It's what Jesus does. And if so be that he finds it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. So it's not God's will that any child should perish, but it's not God's will that any human being should perish because he wants everybody to be converted and to become as little children. God's will is not always done on earth as it is in heaven, though. That's why he told us to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, because he allowed us to make our own choices, and that's what got the world all messed up and why it's still messed up. And sometimes people make horrible choices, and they choose to reject the help that's offered to them through Jesus Christ. But it wasn't God's will for them to perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance, Peter writes. And then he's going to talk about forgiveness. Moreover, verse 15, if your brother shall trespass again, that's in the context of the church, I think, because it's a brother, right? If your, if your brother shall trespass against thee or sin against you or offend you somehow, Jesus is going to give us steps for discipline in the church. Now, People bypass this. <laughs> Jesus gives us three steps. First, if somebody's done something that, you, that really bothers you, he said, you go to them, you go to them alone and talk to them about it in private. That's step number one. Step number two, if they want to hear you, then you take a couple friends with you and, say, and, and let them hear. They'll be witnesses. And if that don't work, he says, then you tell everybody else, we take it to the church. People want to start at number three. Jesus said, no, you, you try to keep it private. Go, just go and tell somebody and be open and honest that, to, that they hurt you or something. Tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Does, now, does it surprise Jesus that sometimes the church hurts people? They hurt one another. Brothers hurt brothers. Because we're human beings, right? And, and boy, the devil wants to use that. Now, sometimes churches do stupid things and hurt a lot of people. Do you know that? That don't mean that there's a problem with God or it just means that human beings make up the church where representatives of God. Sometimes we, we, we make mistakes and we didn't mean to make a mistake. You know, we, were, we thought we were saying the right thing, but we were just making a mistake and we were misrepresenting what we should have been. But uh, don't hold that against God because we're just dumb people. We're just doing the best that we can, Right. But if somebody offends you, said, don't tell them about it. And maybe you can work it out and you'll, you'll gain your brother back. It'll, just, it'll be cool again, right? That's what forgiveness is about. Now, what, there's like two things people usually do instead of what Jesus says, though. One is they just go and tell everybody else instead of telling the one that offended them. And two is they don't tell anybody and they just go around mad and don't like that person for the rest of their life. Where Jesus said, if you go talk to them, maybe you've gained your brother back. But if he won't hear you, verse 16, if he won't listen to you, or usually when he won't listen to you it's because he's convinced he's right and you're convinced you're right. 
And sometimes he might be right. <laughs> you know. But if you want, that's why, okay, if it gets to that point, then you go and you take some a couple with you here. Take, a, take, take with thee one or two more. And then the bottom of verse 16 is a quote out of uh, the Old Testament. I believe it's out of Leviticus. It's in the law here that uh, anything's got to have witnesses to, to be verified. So you take two or three. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Verse 17. And then that's step two. You still ain't got any, any, you ain't got anywhere, and there's still a problem here. So, well, there's step three, verse 17. If you neglect to hear them, if you won't listen to them or you, then tell it to the church and let the church be the judge of this, I guess. But if step three fails, and the guy's obviously wrong and everybody knows it, then it says, well, the church will just treat him like he's a lost person. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And the goal of any kind of New Testament shunning or anything like that is always with redemption in mind. It's always to restore somebody, restoration. Verily I say unto you, whatever, this is the authority of the church too in verse 18, whatever you bind on earth be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth be loosed in heaven. Whatever that means, there's more authority there than we Protestants have ever been willing to claim. But he said it's binding if it goes before the church and the church makes it. And again, I say unto you, verse 19, that if two of you will agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, we usually claim that for prayer. Right? Let's, let's agree in prayer. If two agree, the Lord says he'll do it. Now, it don't say right here, but I'm assuming if I take the rest of the Bible and put it in here, don't you think there's some parameters to that? If it was, all we had to do is two of us get together, we'd do anything in the world. Even bad stuff, right? So there's got to be some parameters. Sometimes we can all be praying for something, and uh, and we don't realize it. A lot of times when we're praying for something and we think that we're really asking for a good thing, and it's all right. The Lord says, let your request be known unto me. And sometimes it looks to like us that we're praying for the absolutely best thing, and we're praying for this, and Lord, why ain't you answering this prayer? And the Lord's saying, because I know more than you. For instance, we pray for an awful lot of sick and dying people here, and sometimes they die. Did we pray wrong? Because if it was up to us, we would never let nobody go to heaven. Would we? <laughs> you know, we're praying, we're praying for them. That's okay, because that's our, what, we're letting our request be known un, unto God, but uh, maybe the Lord says, uh, you don't really know what you're asking. You're asking this person that I'm ready to receive onto heaven, that their body's all wore out and broke down. You're asking to stay there and suffer in the world full of sin from now on. We don't see that because we're full of emotions and love and everything, and it's okay. But, uh, you know, and if we're asking something that's against the will of God, we should, you know, not just in that case, but, you know, sometimes you might be asking for something you don't realize, hey, that's even a sin. You can't, you can't pray for that. But uh, the Lord says, uh, if you're in the will of God, not my will, even Jesus, even Jesus came to a point in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, where his will wasn't being done. But he brought his will in the line of the fathers. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's, prayer changes things. The old bumper sticker you see a lot. Sometimes what prayer changes is you. But it's okay. I mean, if we get together and we pray for something, just like we got through, we got a long list. We prayed for a lot of pe people right here that's sick. And as far as I know, we're praying in the will of God, and I, I believe in prayer. And uh, if one of them don't make it, we just have to accept, hey, that is the Lord's will. It wasn't, it wasn't for us to choose when they go and when they stay. Verse 21, then came Peter to him. Oh, we always got to get Peter in a chapter. Right? P Peter makes the Bible fun, doesn't he? <laughs> Because you and I are a lot like Peter. We open our mouth before we think sometimes, right? So, so Peter, you know, he, he's hearing all this teaching about forgiveness. And his wheels is turning. So he says, uh, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Peter comes up with a pretty good number. He figures that's pretty liberal. Seven times. God's number, right? Seven times. Completion. Perfection. Seven. And, of course, you know what Peter's thinking? That's one. <laughs> and you get that seven times. Buddy, that was seven. <laughs> I don't have to forgive you anymore. 
And the Lord said, uh, no, no, not seven. I say not unto thee till seven times, but until 70 times seven. So you know what Peter is thinking then? That's 490. <laughs> oh, boy. But I think the Lord would probably say, Peter, if you're keeping score, you ain't forgiven. <laughs> now, I do want to back that up a little bit, though. There's a, there's a worldly adage that says uh, you forgive and you forget. It's okay to learn from your mistakes. You can forgive somebody that did something that was harmful to you. Your buddy comes by and he's drinking. Let's run downtown. He has a wreck and he get hurt. You get crippled up and you finally get well and everything. He comes back by drinking again. Let's go downtown. I can get back in the car. Well, you got to forgive me. I forgive you, but I've learned from my mistake. I ain't getting back in the car with you, right? So that forgive and forget ain't right, but but if you're keeping score when people wrong you, you might be a little bit too far the other way too. Forgiveness, it's just the principle of forgiveness because he says if you're converted and become like little children, that's what the kingdom of heaven's like. They're humble, they might get into it, but they forgive one another and they're in the floor coloring again. Therefore, verse 23, is the kingdom of heaven likened, always the kingdom of heaven's like something, it's always in similes, not bullet points. The kingdom of heaven's like, likened unto a certain king. Now he's going to tell this lengthy parable to say here, here's, here's what, what forgiveness is like. This whole chapter sort of been about forgiveness and humbleness. And, and he said, here, here's what it's like. Here, here's what it's like, Peter. Instead of keeping score, it's like this. Well, the kingdom of heaven's like this. Uh, it was like a certain king, verse 23, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, the day of reckoning's come, he's got to settle up with everybody. Somebody, a servant's brought to him, verse 24, which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, you just that's a lot. It was like millions of dollars in today's term. It, it's, a, it's a debt that you can't pay, okay? Look at it that way. But for as much as he had not to pay, he couldn't pay it. His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made to be put in the old debtor's prison. About sell all his stuff and pay, pay for that. The day of reckoning has come and he can't pay it. So we're going to go get everything he's got. And he's going to go to debtor's prison until somebody pays this. So the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. I'll pay all of it. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him from his debt and forgave him the debt. Now, of course, in these verses, you see, this is what God did to us. Sin is a debt that we can't pay. And, and God forgave us all that debt because Jesus paid the debt for us on our behalf and, and now we've been forgiven because the debt's been cleared. Therefore, what's our job? Our, our job is say, well, I know I can't pay you back, Lord. You did it all for me. You paid every bit of it. Just, I'm just going to worship you and praise you for what you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you, as Gomer Powell used to say, right? But if the story ended right there, that would just be the gospel. But unfortunately, it's, uh, it's the gospel, but it's followed by us sinful human beings who are redeemed by the gospel. That same servant, the same servant, verse 28, the one that had been forgiven everything. Now, see, we, we, we was in that story a minute ago, right? I want to be that person in that story that everything's been forgiven. The debt I couldn't pay was forgiven on Calvary. But I don't want to be this person in the, the same servant. Now, verse 28, the same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. It's, it's a piddly thing compared to 10,000 talents. You know, it's like something you could pay, right? And, and he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat, saying, you pay me what you owe me. It doesn't compare with what he's been forgiven, right? But now he finds somebody that owes him a little bit. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience on me and I'll pay you all. Now that's the same words that this servant had used to the certain king. Same words. So when his fellow servant, no, verse 30, he would not. He wouldn't forgive him. 
The story's not so much about money, it's about forgiveness, right? So he would not forgive him. He went and cast him into prison till he could pay all the debt. He didn't have compassion like the king had. He wouldn't forgive. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they come and told their Lord all that was done. Now, now sometimes you see somebody doing wrong, you go to them. If they do it to you, you go to them and you go to them alone. Sometimes they're doing it to somebody else. You don't, if you don't go to them, you just have to go and tell the Lord on them, right? So his fellow servants, said they, they came and they told the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you desired me. God forgave you all your sin debt because you asked him in a prayer one day. You desired him. So shouldn't you also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Now, I've heard this before, and you've probably heard it too. Somebody just so mad at somebody they can kill them, and you try to talk, calm them down, but you don't know what they did to me, right? <laughs> well, maybe I don't, but I know what we did to Jesus, and he forgave us everything. Shouldn't you have compassion? like God does on your fellow servants, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth, angry, and delivered him to the tormentors or the jailers, the torturers, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do to you, if you from your hearts, and that's true forgiveness, not just lip service, but if you from your hearts don't forgive everyone his brother, their trespasses. Now, I also know this. Sometimes you get hurt so bad, it don't matter how hard you try. Even though you can hear this, you can read this, you know that God wants you to forgive them, and you're hurt so bad that you know you need to forgive somebody, but you just can't. Sometimes it takes time. And if you know that about yourself, what you do is you tell the Lord, Lord, I know that I'm having trouble forgiving this person. And if you'll pray that prayer, you may have prayed it every night for a year or two or more. But one day you'll be praying it and you realize that forgiveness has finally taken place. Let's pray. Lord, just help us to remember when we have to deal with people sometimes that offend us and upset us and it's hard for us to forgive us, just help us to always flip that right around. And remember how compassionate you were on us, though we weren't worthy of forgiveness, that you forgave us everything through Christ. In his name we pray, amen.